I'm going to start a few steps back and uh, review a few things from last time. And one of the important formulae that I wrote down was that if you take the generators of the spinner representation of the Lorentz group and compute the commutator with the gamma matrix matrices, you get this uh, mysterious, somewhat mysterious looking formula. Um, something like this, yeah. So this is nothing but an infinitesimal version of the following uh, formula. That, so you have some some matrices which are representation of the Lorentz transformation, but on spinner space, acting on uh, the gamma matrices via similarity transformation. And this results in that, that gamma matrices, the gamma matrices being uh, rotated by a Lorentz transformation. Okay, so this guy, if you now expand this for small uh, values of the parameter, uh, Lorentz transformation parameter, remember this was defined as minus one <coughs> i over two omega mu nu sigma mu nu, and uh, the definition of the Lorentz transformation is similarly <clears throat> where I gave you explicit expressions for the set of matrices, four by four, the matrices M. Now, if you expand those, then uh, and plug those in, in this formula and keep the linear order term, the terms linear or, order in omegas, the parameters, you just get this, okay? <coughs> then uh, by the end of the uh, lecture, we discussed, I gave you a list of objects that I claimed had well-defined Lorentz transformation properties and some well-defined properties under parity. <coughs> so I motivated that under parity, you know, uh, a Dirac spinner should transform like this. Uh, okay, sorry, let me be more specific. Uh, space x time, then uh, and then we saw that under parity, this object transforms like a scalar. That we called it a scalar. Whereas we call this thing a pseudoscalar. However, I did not um, explicitly work out why, for example, this object should be considered a vector. So by vector, what we usually understand is something which transforms like a vector under Boost and boost and rotation, right? But now if we use that second formula over there, then we see that this is a vector because under a Lorentz transformation, psi goes to S of psi, gamma mu is, does not change. Then psi bar goes like S inverse. So this is... Right? 
So thus we see that this object does transform like a vector. Uh, I may have gotten my the position of some of the indices wrong, but <coughs> similarly, if you consider this expression with the gamma five inserted <laughs> under the normal Rollins transformation, that is boosts and rotation. They transform, this guy transforms exactly like this object. So under rotation and boost, this thing also looks like a vector. But under parity, it, its uh, behavior is different from the behavior here. Under parity, what happens is that, so let's call this a V0, V mu. Under parity, V0 goes to V0, but the three component goes to minus of minus this, right? And we can just prove that by using this uh, relationship. Okay. And let's call this guy A of mu, then under parity, the zeroth component. behaves like this, whereas the three components do not change. So this is what we call a pseudo vector. Okay. okay. So these are the things I wanted to uh, review from last time. But also I wanted to just mention that uh, when I derive the dimensionality of the representation of the Dirac spinner. I defined something called vacuum to be a state, to be a, a vector that is annihilated by all the lowering operators that I created from linear combination of the gamma matrices, right? So this is a group theoretic construction. This is not the vacuum in the sense of the physical vacuum, okay? So this is a little bit like, um, you know, if you have, say, two angular momentum, two spin half particles, and you take their tensor product, then you get a spin one particle and a spin zero particle, right? And if I look at the spin zero particle, uh, the, if I look at the z component of, of its spin, then uh, the z component of the spin has either a spin zero or spin minus one or plus one, right? Now we can use the j plus operator to go in this direction, but once we have it reached this state, if I apply j plus again, I get zero. And we get, go to this direction by the J minus operator, but once we have reached this state, when we apply J minus, we go to zero. So in sense, this, this is a vacuum, and this is a vacuum. So that's what I, I called it vacuum. But it's a, I mean, I should not have used, it, used that language, okay? I, I take it back. What I mean is that it's a maximally stressed state. It's a state which is annihilated by all the lowering operator. Okay. All right, so that kind of finishes my review from of last lecture. So that so so far I've kind of given you some transform some overview of the mathematical properties of spinners some of their group theoretic properties. So today, our um, topic is Lagrangians. For spinners. So Lagrangians are where the action is, right? 
ha, ha, ha. See, I can also make puns. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, now you see, we kind of looked at all the nice, all the, all the bilinear of spinners, which transform uh, uh, nicely under the Lorentz transformation. But we know that for physics, we need derivatives in our Lagrangian, right? Without derivatives, there, is, there are no physics. You know? We need calculus. So, um, so a derivative operator, this uh, transform as a covariant vector. Okay? So, so we can, so this should transform as a kind of a scalar, but of course, it'll only transform as a scalar if I sandwich it between two uh, Dirac spinners. So that should be a scalar, right? Because this guy transforms as a co covariant vector. So I think it's a covariant vector. Whereas the other guys, as we saw there, they transform as a contravariant vector. So the combination is a scalar, is a Lorentz scalar. And then we multiply it by an i because I will argue that putting an i there makes the Lagrangian real. Uh, makes the action real under integration by parts, OK? So, so this is basically you know, a good kinetic term. So you might say, OK, why did not we say do something like this as our kinetic term, right? So it has, you can show that you know, kinetic terms like that do not lead to positive energies if psi is a spinner. Apart from that, if we had a kinetic term like this, this would not force psi to be a spinner. It would only force psi to be a, a complex scalar. Right? So we need to write a kinetic term which forces psi to be a spinner, which is something that is uh, done admirably by this guy, right? Like this thing will not be Lorentz invariant if psi is not a spinner. Whereas this, this term doesn't care if psi is a spinner or not. So that's why we need to enforce the, the spinner nature of psi by writing something like this. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes. So actually, we'll get the kinetic term, one of the terms in the Dirac equation from this Lagrangian. Okay. So before, so this is not not good. <coughs> so before we, you know, go and add terms to this, you know, just uh, let's do a little bit of dimensional analysis. So action in our uh, in our case would be given something like this right <coughs> so in the units that that we are using which are units where h bar is equal to c is equal to 1 <coughs> the action doesn't have any dimensions it's dimensionless but The mass dimension of the measure of the action is, what is it? Minus 4, yes. <coughs> so what is the dimension of this guy? Plus 1, right. So then what should be the dimension? Mass dimension of the spinners. Complex conjugation should not really change the dimension. Yeah, of it. 
Yeah, gammas are just numbers, yes. They're dimensionless. Three halves, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's the dimensionality of uh, <coughs> of the spinners. So <coughs> given this, now let us write a mass term. So the mass term should be invariant. So let's uh, take a uh, leaf out of our uh, uh, Klein-Gordon Lagrangian and write the mass term like this. So this, what is the dimensionality of this constant now? Mass. So, so whereas in the Klein-Gordon case, the dimensionality of the, of the, of the what's the dimension of the Klein-Gordon field? Scalar field. Yeah, in four dimensions. One. So there we had an m squared, but here we only need to, we have something of the, of, uh, <coughs> the constant is, has the same dimension as mass, so we let's rewrite it as m, okay? So this way we uh, arrive at the famous Dirac-Lagrangian. where this is uh, the famous uh, Feynman slash notation. So I, the fact that you know this, so this term is real, manifestly real. This term, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to show that is real under integration by parts, okay? All right, any questions so far? Good, I like a quiet class. So uh, let's derive the equations of motion using the Euler-Lagrange equation. So let's write, what is the Euler-Lagrange equation say for the psi bars? And now I'm writing the spinner index explicitly. So it's, so there's this term, and then we can, always divide this term into two parts, like half and half, and just integrate one of the parts and rewrite the, the Dirac-Lagrangian in a way where you have one term which is acting on the derivative of psi, another term which is acting on the derivative of psi bar. We can always do that, but we won't. <coughs> so, um, this gives us the famous Dirac equation. Okay. Because the Dirac equation is relativistic, and because it's a wave equation, it has to solve the Klein-Gordon equation. Because the Klein-Gordon equation is Classically speaking, is nothing but a statement about the relativistic invariance of, of uh, you know, of waves propagating. So, <clears throat> how if if you want to see this, you apply this operator to the Dirac equation. So, and do a little bit of algebra. So. The first term becomes gamma mu, gamma nu, 
mu of nu. <coughs> The cross terms cancel out. Now, because mu, the partial derivatives are symmetric, I can rewrite this term in terms of an anti-commutator for gammas, and then use the Dirac algebra. And then, then this term becomes the D'Alembertian. So the Dirac equation satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. Sorry, the Dirac spinner satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. Historically, this is how Dirac discovered <coughs> the gamma, uh, the, the Dirac algebra. He wrote down a one. A, he wrote down an equation which was first order in time because he was looking for a first order first derivative in time equation because he wanted to mimic the positive probability density of Schrodinger's equation. But relativity told him that then his spatial derivatives also needs to be first order. So he wrote something down, and he contracted the derivatives with some objects. He called them alphas and betas, alpha and betas. We are calling them gammas. He didn't know what those objects, what um, properties they, uh, they had to satisfy. And then he said, well, I'm going to impose the fact that is any solution to my equation must satisfy, must also be a solution to the Klein-Gordon equation. So, and he found that if that was going to be true, that will be true only if those uh, gamma objects, they satisfy the Dirac algebra. That's how Dirac discovered the Dirac algebra. Uh, yeah, and, and after that, you know, there's this clever argument that you go to a different reference frame and you want the same equation to be, the, uh, to, uh, to be valid, then, that, then the, that, that, that relationship be, uh, for the gamma matrices follow from that. That's the historical route, but we are not going down that route. Okay, so, so now what I'm... I, I, what we are going to do is that we are going to just uh, rewrite the Dirac Lagrangian in the Carroll basis or the Val basis. Okay. So before I do that, let me just step. Yes. Uh, before you go, yeah. so if I recall correctly, we, we did that and found the matrices have to be at least four-dimensional. Right. Could be higher. Uh, yeah, I, they could be higher, but I don't think you'd have. Uh, they'd be, uh, for massive case, they would still be reducible. But if mass, if M is non-zero, th the lowest dimensionality that you could have is four by four. But if you go higher, I think you could still satisfy that, but then that representation for the massive case would actually not be rep uh, uh, irreducible. So the 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 point, uh, we'll see. We'll get okay. I think it'll become a little bit, bit more clear what I'm going to say when we look at this, uh, the Dirac Lagrangian in the vial uh, representation. Okay, so the vial representation. Before I do that, let's revisit the vial representation. In the vial representation, a Dirac spinner has a left handed part and a right handed part. Okay? <coughs> So <clears throat> now, if I write in the vowel representation, the, the spin, spinorial representation of the Lorentz ele group elements, they are block diagonal. So there is some left component, and there is some right component. And recall that the bar is this object. And do you remember what gamma 0 is? Anyone? Um, 
Okay, you, uh, yeah, Morton, you've been chosen. Zero, one, one, zero. Good. So that means that this is going to be phi r dagger, <laughs> chi l dagger, right? Uh, this is an important point. So now, under Lorentz transformation, the Dirac Uh, spinner goes something like this. It transforms like this. But what it means is that it means that the left component transforms like this. But its Hermitian conjugate <coughs> transforms in the in that way, okay? So let me just raise this. Right, you just like plug this expression in here and the and in the bars, right? Uh, have you got your chi's and phi's then? Uh, okay, sorry, yeah. Uh, this should be a chi, right? Yeah, chi. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, chi L, Chi L, <coughs> and then Chi. Sorry, okay. Chi L, Chi L. Okay. Right. So what it's saying is that the left-handed wall spinner transforms in the left-handed representation, but the Hermitian conjugate transforms in some sense in the right-handed. Uh, 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 representation. So, right. And if I now plug in this expression into our favorite expression up there, then we get The result that S L inverse acting on sigma mu S R is gamma mu of nu sigma nu and S R inverse acting on sigma bar of mu S L sigma bar. So I'm just like translating the <coughs> properties of the four-dimensional gamma matrices to the uh, two by two sigma matrices. So now let's rewrite the kinetic term for the Dirac Lagrangian in terms of the left-handed and the right-handed fields. Then we have, so I'm going to drop the D from now on. So this is I. Uh, phi r dagger comma 
and this is So let's pause for a second and look at and stare at this formula or at this expression. And uh, I want to claim that each of these terms is invariant under the Lorentz transformation <coughs> as we have written it out in two component notation, right? <coughs> that should be obvious from those, those formula. Like we know how sigma mu and sigma mu bar transform. We know how chi L and chi L dagger transform. And we know how the deltas transform, right? the, the derivatives transform. So these, so, so now I can write a kinetic term for what I will call a vial spinner. a left-handed vowel spinner to be this. So this is a perfectly OK Lorentz invariant Lagrangian for a two-component vowel spinner. Yes? Could you repeat how we knew that <coughs> S of lambda broke up into that? Right. Block? Yeah. So uh, the way it happened is that we wrote that. Was it because the S commuted with gamma five or something? Sorry? Was it because the S commuted with gamma five? five? Yes. Because S commuted with gamma five in the basis, in the representation in which gamma five is diagonal, S then has to be diagonal. And when, the, the sigmas. And when we exponentiate the sigmas, you know, they would respect that block diagonal form. Yes, we did. Uh, when we did the, remember psi L went like for the infinite, infinitesimal case, we did one plus, I forget if there was a plus or minus here, beta <coughs> dot sigma minus I theta dot sigma by two psi L, right? So this is the infinitesimal version of this guy. Okay. So similarly, we can write down a Lagrangian for the right-handed component, and they do not need to be, they do not need to come from a master Lagrangian, right? So that, this Lagrangian by itself is a good theory of a free two-component spinner. It's a vowel spinner. Now, on physical ground, we don't expect the spinner to have uh, mass because vowel spinners are eigenstates of the helicity operator. And, <coughs> and, and the, OK, this is something I'm just going to say. If it doesn't make sense, we can talk about this later but it'll take some while to sink in. <coughs> if, so, you know, we are calling these, uh, these spinners left-handed and right-handed. That means that this is a frame-independent statement that we are making. That in all <coughs> reference frames, all boosted, they should, for, you know, related by each other by boosts, they should all be left-handed. But, you know, the helicity of an object flips if it's massive you can, you can make it flip. The thing is that, 
So suppose a, a, a particle with some mass is traveling in some direction, and there is a, it has a certain spin. Now, if you, if you boost your reference frame, which is moving faster than, than the object, then although its, uh, its uh, direction of spin doesn't change, its momentum does. So the helicity flips. But for massless particles, you cannot do that. And therefore, for massless particles, helicity is a good quantum number. Right? So let's just see this mathematically that you know, if you try to add the, a mass term for the valve spinner, it doesn't work. So let's uh, write out our mass term that we figured we added to the Dirac spinner. And now if we now write it out in terms of our two component left-handed and right-handed objects. Right, so this guy by itself, so okay, so what we see is that the the, the mass terms mix the different representations, okay? So we could not write a mass term purely in terms of chi's. At least that mass term does not come from this mass term. Now in your homework, there is a, the second problem is about how to write down spinners, two component spinners which do have masses. Such spinners cannot, do not have a left-handed or a right-handed uh, interpretation. Uh, and those spinners are called Majorana spinners. And uh, so I'm going to turn to the definition of the Majorana spinners next, okay? Before I move on, any question? Sorry? I thought the Majorana spinners are massive. No, the Vowel spinners are massless. Dirac spinners are massive. Majorana spinners are spinners which are their own <coughs> antiparticles. So uh, they do not have the, the charge is not conserved for, for the simplest Majorana spinners. Oh, I, it was just a way for me to kind of show you that each of these components of the Dirac spinner give rise to a kinetic term, which is invariant under Lorentz transformation. So this guy is not, does not get mixed up with this guy. Therefore, let me just finish, then I'll... Therefore, we can just use this to write down another Lagrangian just for chi L. But we cannot do that for the mass terms. Okay, so, so you also had something else to say. Yeah, for the valve spinners, they're not being massive. The valve spin. So yeah, uh, if we call a valve spinner to be a, to be the object which follows uh, from a Lagrangian like this, we cannot write down a mass term for them. Therefore, we, they cannot be the massive. I mean, I, I haven't really given you a proof. All I've said is that the mass term that, you know, if you were to try to mimic the same thing that happened here, but from this mass term, we fail. Okay, therefore we don't add those mass terms. Yeah? The way you bring it down, can you think of a Dirac field as like two wall fields? Exactly. Like the so the Dirac field can be thought of as a left-handed wall spinner and a right-handed wall spinner, and they are related by the Dirac equation, the mass term of the Dirac equation. The mass term of the Dirac equation mixes them up. That's how we can think of it. Okay, so. <coughs> Mr. Majorana vanished, but his spinner didn't. So, 
so far, you know, we have written down a Dirac spinner in terms of left-handed and right-handed, you know, vowel spinners. And they are completely different objects. They don't have to have any relationship. But what if we relate them? We can relate them, right? We can impose a condition which relates the left-handed and the right-handed while spinners. <coughs> so, <coughs> yeah? Uh, why do you sometimes write I all and sometimes psi all? Uh, and I'm not committed to all, any, uh, any <laughs> Greek letter, I guess. Uh, yeah. It's very confusing. I know it's very confusing because sometimes psi, it seems like, is a four-component object. Object, and then when I write psi l, it's a two-component object, and then I'm very sorry. I mean, it's it's a, it's a bad habit. Yeah, don't. So yeah, it's a, it's a contextual. You know, the interpretation of the symbol is contextual, and the symbol means what that the symbol defines that context, right? So it's all circular. <laughs> you could just stop calling. Okay, Tom. <laughs> Tom left, Tom right. <laughs> okay. okay. But if, you know, um, Mike's got a point, so I'm just going to, since I'm going to relate them, let's uh, call this uh, left hand spur chi. Then note that if I write psi of r to be minus i sigma 2 chi star, then that's consistent with the way a Dirac spinner transforms, right? Because in last class, we saw that when the way that psi transformed Sigma 2 of, of the complex conjugate of that object transformed in, in the, uh, the right-handed way, opposite way, right? Sorry, I should repeat that. So psi L transforms in one way, psi R transforms in another way. But psi L star multiplied by sigma 2 transforms in the same way as psi R. So if I identify psi L to be this, psi r up to some constant, which I choose to be minus i for this lecture, it's consistent with the way that Dirac psi d transforms. Is this a claim that it can be written like that, or it has been like that? Uh, it, up to a constant, if I am going to identify, make a relationship between psi l and psi r, it has to be like that, up to a constant, uh, which I choose to be minus i. So having done that, you can easily check that the complex conjugate of the Dirac spinner is related to the Dirac spinner by this matrix. Where I call this C, or the charge conjugation matrix. Okay. And this C is a unitary, so it looks an E. Anyway. Right. So I'm, I'm kind of, you know, uh, Getting ahead a little, getting a little ahead of myself because I'm calling this charge conjugation matrix, but I've not told you what charge conjugation is. So that will be the content of next week's first tutorial. Is uh, we'll talk about charge conjugation. Yes. So why does it seem to be the constant? Um, it shows that sigma two psi l star transforms as psi r. Right. Uh, 
Um, So the transit that you choose there actually uh, is related to the explicit expression for the C. Uh, you know, let me think about that. Uh, it's a good question. I, and I actually uh, was trying to figure this out earlier today, but I ran out of time. So let me think about that. Okay. In fact, you know, in the homework, we ch I have a different choice there. So just to make it consistent with test given. Okay. Uh, so we define for, so this is for any Dirac spinner. So define <coughs> for any Dirac spinner psi a charge conjugate which we shall call psi c by <coughs> psi of c is defined to be the charge conjugation, conjugation matrix acting on the spinner side. Okay. So having done that, Okay, where C has these properties. And so, so the definition of a Majorana spinner, so this now I'm going to give you a basis independent definition. So A Majorana <coughs> spinner is one which satisfies this condition. In other words, a Majorana spinner is its own charge conjugate. Sometimes they're called real spinners because somehow you're saying that, so there is a representation of the gamma matrices in which a Majorana spinner is actually real. Or is it a, yeah, yeah, it's real and the, and the Dirac matrices in that representation are imaginary, pure imaginary. Okay. <coughs> so, I understand, I understand, like, in terms of your kind of two alternative definitions of C, two different ways you define C here, one of which is like basis dependent, one of which is basis independent. Right, right. Is the C on the left, like this matrix you've written down, is that a special case of the C on the right? right. And in which case that's that, it, that, that is the, in the chiral representation. The chiral representation. Yeah. Now, this is there only one C for like is that C well defined by the equations on the right? Uh, yes, it should be yes. It it is yeah. yeah it's yeah, it's all related by some similarity transformation. Okay. In fact, you can I think it's you can show it to be gamma two, right? Or is that a choice? So, so psi Textbooks are mysteriously vague about this point, you know. So psi c is well defined, and in the Dirac representation, psi c is equal to psi r. Not the Dirac, the VAR representation. The VAR Nobody talks about the Dirac the representation. VAR representation. Very few people do, but there is a gamma matrix representation called the Dirac representation. People usually talk about the VAR representation because things look. The thing is that when you write down the standard model, the standard model is not symmetric. It's a parity violating. So when you write down the Lagrangian for the standard model in which all its symmetries manifest, 
you have to write it down in terms of two component spinners, in terms of vowel spinners. And then, you know, so it's very popular. <coughs> the, the vowel representation for that reason is very popular. But, okay. but sorry, but in the, in the vowel representation, we just happen to have the psi star equals psi c. Right, exactly. Yeah. <coughs> well, you know, psi star, yes, yes. Right, so the, yes, good. Okay, now the next half an hour of your life is going to be the most tedious half an hour of your life. So please, like, just, you know, call up the deep resolve that you have inside of you. The deep resolve that made you become a physicist. Because I'm going to talk about the classical solutions of Dirac equations. This is just has to be done. Like, there is no other way. But there won't be anything conceptually. Actually, there is a conceptual something. I'll try to point it out. But there's a lot of formula that I'm not going to prove. It's a couple of lines of algebra, really. But OK, so. So classical solutions of, of the Dirac equation. So the Dirac, the solution to the Dirac spinner solves the Klein-Gordon equation. So we know that such a solution must exist. So P is a four vector. It is the momentum of a part of, of associated with the momentum. And uh, we know that you know these form the complete basis for the uh, positive energy, sorry, the positive frequency modes of the Klein-Gordon. Uh, 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 classical field, right? So uh, why is it called? So here we say P0 is greater than 0. Why is, what are these guys called positive frequency modes? Uh, historically, these were thought to be positive energy modes. And that's because the energy operator in quantum mechanics is something like this. And when you apply it to uh, to this guy, you get a positive energy right, for P0. And that's why they were called. Now we understand that the negative energy modes are actually, they have positive energy. So now we call them just negative frequency modes. And these are called the positive frequency mode. But the positive frequency mode has a minus sign in terms in front of the P dot x. Yes? Satisfying the negative energy. Uh, because it's, uh, if you write down the Hamiltonian that comes from the quantum, the, from the quantum field after quantizing it, that, ham, the ener that measures the quantum, real quantum energy, right? You know, the, you know, that actually has a positive definite energy, right? <laughs> silly for me. You gotta call it something. <laughs> Just moving backwards in time, perfectly great. Right. Well, let's call this something. The other call, they call the other thing nothing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, of course, this does not guarantee that you know this is going to solve the Dirac equation. Okay. So, if we require this psi also solves the Dirac equation, that's going to put some constraints on these four component objects u. So let's put in the spinner index explicitly. The spinner index goes here. <coughs> in the literature, some people will call these spinners and these spinners interchangeably. Just be warned. 
So now if you plug this into the Dirac equation in the Carroll basis, this is the equation, we get this equation. So let's write uh, our four component spinners as in terms of two component, two two component spinners, U1 of P. So this has two components and U2 of P. Okay. So when we plug this guy into the Dirac equation, we get So in the limit, <coughs> so in the limit where our particle is at rest, that is we put P mu to be this guy. Let's call, let's give this a name, P mu of zero. In that limit, you know, these two uh, you know, p dot sigma and p dot sigma bar, that they just become m. And uh, we have u1 of p0 becomes equal to u2 of p0. And then we can call them proportional to some... Um, two component uh, spinner uh, uh, psi. Now the thing is, uh, and this is a choice of no normalization that is going to be uh, convenient for us, and we choose psi to have this normalization. Now because both u1 and u2 are two component objects. Psi has two independent uh, components, right? So this, you can you can have psi one and psi two. This is a two-dimensional two uh, column vector. <coughs> so <coughs> starting from this choice of u one and u two, when the value of the momentum is this, we can now boost this. We can apply a Lorentz boost <coughs> to the momentum P. So apply a Lorentz boost to the momentum P. <coughs> and uh, and the say and the and you know the related boost to the spinner. We know how to work out the spin representation of Lorentz boost. See, doing that, we get u of p for an arbitrary value of p. Uh, value of p. Okay. So you, you apply some Lorentz boost on this guy. So here we are taking the square root of a matrix. I hope you know how to take the square root of a matrix. So this is something to work out on a Friday evening. Uh, very, very helpful in these sort of manipulations. What's, what's coming is this identity. This is a... Uh, Relativistic generalization of a Pauli matrix identity. Okay, we are almost there.
So I hope it is obvious to you that u bar is defined by u dagger of gamma 0. Okay? <coughs> oh, did I define u bar? Okay, I'm defining u bar here. So, so now we can calculate the inner product between u bar and u. Then you can show that this is given by this. And you know the way that we chose, uh, yeah, our normalization for uh, for psi. That means this is two of m. So this is a relativistically invariant normalization. M is a relativistic invariant. <clears throat> so now we can choose, you know, uh, a basis for psi, an orthogonal basis. So let's call those psi one and psi two, and then we get the relationship, which is <coughs> orthonormality means this. So when we do this, the u or the u bar, which we get by putting either psi 1 and psi 2, we call that u1 or u2. Uh, now it's a u superscript. Okay. Uh, hang on, I'm going to be a little careful here. Okay, so so we can say U of S of P is P dot sigma, P dot sigma bar, psi of S, psi of S. Okay? And similarly for U bar. Then you can verify these relationships. U bar S of P u of r of p is 2m delta r of s. However, if I compute this guy, so there is no gamma 0 in between, this thing gives me 2 of ep delta of uh, Rs, which is something <coughs> that is not completely unexpected because the left-hand side is no longer a Lorentz invariant quantity because there's no bar here. The right-hand side is not a Lorentz invariant quantity, right? <coughs> okay. So now, so that... That's all we have to say for now about the positive frequency modes or something modes. Now let's go to the nothing modes. So there should also be solutions to the Dirac equation, which would have the form of e to the power plus i p dot x. So just a reminder, whenever I say p dot x, I mean the four vector contraction. Okay. So going through the same argument as above, we find solutions of V of the form I'm using eta here, but eta have the same properties as psi. So etas satisfy the same relationship as this. So that there are two etas, eta 1 and eta 2. Uh, they correspond to spin up and spin down. 
Yeah? You're right. So that was completely intentional. I just wanted to check whether Tom was paying attention. <laughs> okay. And similarly, we have relationships such as whenever there's a bar, so this is easy to remember, whenever there's a bar here, and uh, there's P and V of S of P, this should be something Lorentz invariant, and it's minus 2M of delta R of S, and, uh, but when there is no bar, just a dagger, <coughs> It's plus 2 E of P delta of Rs. Uh, okay, let's bring that down. So now we have kind of worked out the inner products between the, uh, for the U's and the V's. Now we can ask what happens when we take uh, the inner product between U's and V's. That is the inner product between some things and nothings. Then sometimes you get something, sometimes you get nothing. Right, so U bar of P, this is S, V of R of P is equal to V bar of S of P, U of R of P, and that's zero. But as you may have guessed, this thing is not zero. However, you can verify that if you flip the sign of the spatial momenta of one of the spinners, then that is zero. God knows what this means, but this is extremely useful when you are doing canonical commutation relationships and you have to redefine three momentum <coughs> P to be minus the three momentum of P. <coughs> so that's very useful. Similarly, right. That you don't, uh, yeah, P0 is positive in both cases. You don't flip the sign of the, the energy is the same because whether you flip the sign of the, of the three momentum doesn't change the uh, energy. Uh, okay, so that's one. Similarly, uh, you know, V of S, This guy isn't zero, but if I uh, if I just take if I just flip the the three component uh, the sign of the three component, then that thing is zero. Okay. All right. We're almost there. So when you uh, calculate physical cross-sections in scattering amplitudes, a lot of times what we do is that we send in unpolarized beams. That means that we are summing over the spin indices, spinner indices. Well, uh, we don't care if, well, you know, if it's psi 1 or psi 2 or u1 or u2. Because uh, the interpretation of this index is that 
it can be spin up or spin down, right? And the Vs <coughs> also spin up and spin down, but the interpreter, you'll see uh, in the next lecture that the Us accompany the, Us represent the, uh, the particle states, the polarizations and the momentums of the particle states. Uh, well, the polarizations of the particle, uh, the spin of the particles, whereas Vs represent the spins of the antiparticles. Okay. And in experiments, we send in a lot of times unpolarized states, and our detectors do not distinguish between the polarization. So a lot of times we have to sum over these polarizations. Yeah. Yes, Dan? Do you mean sum or average? For the initial? Uh, for the initial, it's average, because, but, but for the final, it's sum. You're right, yeah. When you <coughs> talk about like the spins being in different <coughs> states, if we go to like a higher, high dimensional representation of the Dirac algebra, does that give us high dimensional spins? Like we go to three over the third, spin three on two, and so on and so forth? What do we have to um, Right, so uh, when you go to a higher dimensional representation of the Dirac algebra, so suppose you take, uh, you can build those up out of products of, say, smaller, uh, you know, representations, and then it'll depend on what representation you're looking at. Some will have spinner index, some will have vector indices. So there will be ways of Spinner uh, represent ind indices combining to give you a vector index and things like that. And that would be if it was spin. Well, there could be spin three halves, for example. You know, there are th spin three halves particles and stuff. Well, not in well in nature there are. I mean, they are very short lived, but there are fundamental theories of spin three halves particles as well. So, yeah. So if I take if I were to take um, these irreps, sorry, no, sorry. If I was Just to take these irreps and like smash them together to make a high dimensional representation, I'd find it would be like two, it would be maybe dimension two to the n. And if n is even, then it's like a, it's an odd, it's a half integer spin. If n is an <coughs> integer spin, so that means if n is odd, I can combine the spinner indices to get big vector indices, or am I, is that right? Uh, yes, I mean, okay. Uh, right, so the gamma mu, the sigma mu's, these guys, will have, these have spinner indices, and this has vector indices. So these guys, for example, when you, you know, smash it and stuff like this with the appropriate uh, spinners, you actually get a vector, right? Just like that term, right? I mean, you know, the vector that we defined at the beginning of the class, you know, uh, that's just one example of getting a spin one particle from two spin half representations. So there's a whole, you know, uh, well-defined way of deriving those things. So yeah, but you're right. Uh, let me just carry on because I have 11 minutes left. Actually, 11 minutes plus change. Uh, um, okay. So this, so what I said was to motivate the next formula, which is if you take the outer product of the spinners. So I'm taking the, so here it's the, it's the spinner which is coming first and the conjugate spinner is coming second. And I'm summing over the S. So this is a uh, four by four matrix. And this has, in the chiral representation, <clears throat> this has this expression, where similarly, if I sum over the Vs, So this is something that's very useful in practical calculations. Okay.
So now we are, yes? Right, sometimes you put in uh, four vector P in the argument, sometimes you put in. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, they're, uh, it's, I'm kind of using them interchangeably. I'm, they're all on shell, so I'm assuming that P, the three vector P determines the fourth component, but yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, in the last 10 minutes, uh, Okay, I'm just going to write uh, down a formula for now for this for the general solution of the Dirac equation. I'm not going to dwell on it because we'll we'll you know we're going to like uh, examine it to its death in the next lecture. But given all of this, we can write down the general solution to the Dirac equation as. Uh, okay, I'm going to be lazy and use the fourth blackboard. So, yeah? Uh, we haven't really uh, done any quantum field theory yet. We haven't imposed any canonical commutation or anti-commutation relationships. Uh, this, I mean, it's quantum mechanical in the old sense, but not quantum field theoretic, right? In, we, are, we are looking for, we, are, we quantize, when we say quantize in this course, we are doing a canonical quantization a la quantum field theory, but we are not, the X's are not, say, operators. The, uh, the position, there's no position operator, you know? The momentum, of, there is no derivative, oper the gradients are not momentum operator, for example. So the general solution uh, is then d k 2 pi cubed relativistic normalization sum over the polarizations U of S. It's, uh, I was calling it U of S like this. Let's stick to that, at least for today. I'm gonna confuse Ryan again. And, and, and now we have the A's. Actually, A's, I like to use A's for scalar fields, so let's use B's here. So the B of S of P, these are the Fourier coefficients. These are the somethings. And because the Dirac uh, you know, spinner doesn't have to be real, it's, we have a different set of coefficients. Let's call these B stars for now. Yeah, I know. Okay. So that's the general solution. Where the A's and the B stars are the Fourier Oh, God. That should be C. I want to have something different here. Oh, God. Okay. Okay, in the, in the remaining five minutes, I will just kind of start on something new. Well, not, well, a new aspect of the Dirac Lagrangian, which I think is essential, is we are going to talk about the symmetries of the Dirac theory. So because I'll have very little time, I will just use the fourth blackboard here. So remember Noether's theorem. Suppose you have some continuous symmetry, continuous transformation of your fields 
and uh, which for the infinitesimal case takes this form. And suppose that under such transformation, the Lagrangian changes up to a total derivative, then your action is invariant, provided that the fields kind of go to uh, zero fast enough at infinity. Then Noether's theorem tells you that there is, exists a current which is conserved, and the current is given by this expression. Where the sum over A is implied. So this is just recapping Noether's theorem. Now let's see what kind of symmetries we have for our Dirac <laughs> theory and what are the conserved currents that uh, Noether's theorem gives us. So the first symmetry, the only one that I'll have time to cover today, is the global U1 symmetry. So if I take the Dirac spinners and transform them by a constant phase factor, then psi bar of x goes to e to the power minus i alpha of psi bar of x, then this is an obvious symmetry of the Lagrangian for alpha's constant, right? They are not uh, functions of space-time. So then delta of psi in that case is i alpha of psi and delta of psi bar is minus i alpha of psi bar. And you plug these, okay, sorry. And delta of L is zero. It does not change. At each order then you can easily show that the conserved current is psi bar of gamma mu of psi. And to show that this is conserved, you have to use the equation of motion. So this is a conserved current for the on-shell uh, you know, Dirac field. Okay? And I'm, you know, <coughs> I'm not going to do that, but this is the famous uh, Dirac current, you know, Dirac was looking for this guy. He wanted uh, to, to have this thing a probabilistic interpretation. It turned out it, it doesn't have a probabilistic interpretation. Uh, it only does, it's an approximate, only in the low energy limit does it have a probabilistic interpretation when you don't have any antiparticles. <coughs> but what it does is that it has the interpretation of electric charge, uh, sorry, electric current. So you saw an analog of this guy in Dan's class when Dan talked about the complex scalar field, okay? But in that case, you know, uh, so you know, if you look at the J0 part, it is you know, positive definite, right? And Dirac thought, ah, yes, I've got probability density, which is positive. Turns out it's particle density, really. Or, Actually, no, it's charge density. Because although, you know, classically this is a, yeah, on, on a negative, up, uh, so its value will depend on what state you apply it on. Yeah. So, anyway, those are historical remarks, so I, you know, don't take them too seriously. So I actually do have a few more minutes because I, I, I started a bit late. But I just don't want, this is Friday, and you know, people want to go home, I'm sure. So I will let you guys go. Okay? Have a good weekend. <laughs>